let's set the stage a little bit. Uh, what I want to do is just walk you through simply a velocity banking uh, example. And the objective is to kind of highlight some of the points and reasons why velocity banking is even a thing. And so I think the easiest thing to do is to walk through an example. So we got my buddy uh, Alex here who's in need of a vehicle. How would most people go about purchasing a vehicle? They go to the dealership, find a the vehicle they want, end up getting traditional financing either through the dealership itself or through their local bank or credit union and then pay that bill off and away you go. Some 60 month loan and we're done. But there are many different ways to approach this. And um, what I'm about to walk you through, yeah, it's about purchasing a vehicle, but you can apply this to purchasing a home, pay, purchasing actually any asset that you're wanting to be able to use that asset over a period of time and not give up all of your cash. So again, for the cash is king people, the thought process might be, I won't get that vehicle until I've saved up enough. And then once I've saved up enough, I'm going to pay, pay cash for that vehicle and purchase it, right? So in this case, Alex makes a decent income, has decent credit, a decent DTI, and he's got about, he makes about $3,000 a month and his objective is to go find himself a vehicle. Well, he found one. Maybe not my choice, Bruh. but the moral of the story is he found this vehicle that he wants, some electric scooter for about $10,000. And the question is, how do you go about purchasing it? And again, there's a traditional way, and then there's a way to do it through velocity banking. So from a traditional financing perspective, you got this $10,000 uh, vehicle that you're purchasing. And you, again, you go to your local bank and you end up off, being offered 8% on this $10,000. And so if you were to pay that 10, and with a monthly payment of about $202 a month. Well, $202 a month over a five-year period for a $10,000 vehicle at 8%, you know, kind of what does that look like? That's the traditional way of going about things. That's the traditional way of dealing with um, debt. So over time, what does that look like? Well, at $10,000 over a five-year period at a rate of 8%, over that five-year period, you would have paid that vehicle off and you would have paid about $2,166 in interest. And again, not, not a huge dollar amount, but again, this is the way we traditional, traditionally think about um, approaching debt and paying off that debt. So again, $10,000 was the cost, but you end up paying 10 plus two, about 12, <clears throat> about 12, $12,166 in total is what's end up being paid over that five year period. Is there a way to improve upon this? Is there a way to address this same activity by the same vehicle, use it for the same period of time, but have better use of your dollar. Cause what's actually happened here, whether we're talking about our cash people or um, our um, low debt, low credit individuals, whoever, what's happening is the income that you make is going towards this purchase. And once it goes towards this purchase, you never have access to that dollar again. So it simply goes away. So in essence, what you're doing is you're giving the bank someone's bank, 2,100 bucks in interest that you're paying. But what if we applied a different process, a different thought process, velocity banking, and to kind of set the stage for velocity banking, it kind of starts with what is it? What does that even mean? And I'd like to spend a little bit of time, a little bit of time here, just kind of detailing what specifically I'm talking about. And I know this being on black, it may be a little bit hard to see, so I'll, I'll walk through it. In essence, As your paycheck comes in, as your income from your paycheck comes into your account, it goes immediately into your checking account. From a velocity banking perspective, what we're saying is take all of the income that's going into your checking account and move that income into a debt tool. Now, there's many different types of debt tools and we'll get into that. But once that all of that income goes into that debt tool, bills still have to be paid. But one bill that does not have to be paid is the bill on this debt tool. And I'll get into that as well. But you put all of your income onto the debt tool, you end up, then end up paying all of your bills from the debt tool. But what ends up happening? Any cash flow that's left, any income that's left over ends up living on the debt tool. And so what ends up happening is the traditional cash flow that's normally sitting in your checking account or the traditional cash flow that you end up taking from your second checking account and putting it into your savings account. That traditional cash flow ends up living on the debt tool. And what ends up happening is the balance on that debt tool ends up getting cut down and ends up getting paid down faster and faster and faster. 
So again, looking at things from a traditional approach, your money would come into your checking account. Any bills that you would end up paying, you would pay from that checking account. And then any cash flow that's left over ends up going back into or staying in, in that checking account or move, being moved to savings, making you 0.01% or whatever that uh, dollar amount might be. And in this case, we've got Alex who makes $3,000 a year. I'm sorry, $3,000 a month. And his expenses in total is about 2,500. That 2,500 not only includes his regular expenses, but it also includes that $200 payment. I know it's about $202, but we're, we're rounding. So the $202 payment for the scooter is also included in this 2,500. So at the end of the day, when all bills are paid, he's left with $500. The thought process is, can we do something different with this process so that he can get better use out of this cash flow? So let's get into it. So in order to fully go into velocity banking, the person that's doing the velocity banking has to grab a debt tool. But in order to grab a debt tool, we have to first define what is that? Like, what is it? What do I mean when I'm when I'm when I mention a debt tool? Well, there's many different types. We're talking just a minute. We're talking traditional credit cards can be used as a debt tool. We're talking personal personal lines of credit can be used as a debt tool. How about home equity lines of credit can be used as a debt tool. Any of you that have a 401k with a current employer or a self-directed 401k through me, you have access to uh, a personal loan. And that personal loan can absolutely be used as a debt tool. Now, if you're getting a loan from a uh, from your traditional employer, they may have restrictions around what you can or can't do, but there's this there's an unlimited list of what you can use as a debt tool, which is why we kind of left this open. Because for instance, there's some there's some items here that I haven't mentioned. Any of you heard of um, anything around the li long lines of IBC, Infinite Banking? Well, Infinite Banking is a concept where you're using cash value life insurance products to be able to um, address debt and then you recapture the interest that you were paying to someone else and you re recapture it into your own vehicle. In essence, IBC, infinite banking, is just velocity banking using a whole life policy. And then we mentioned this earlier, MPI. MPI is a form of banking on yourself on steroids, which means you allow it allows you to be able to do it faster, um, use high, using higher level of um, 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 debt consolidation, and also your the amount grows inside of your policy four to three three to four times faster than uh, a traditional retirement account or a traditional whole life policy. My point is there are many different versions of a debt tool. For this example, we're going to use a personal line of credit, not for any other reason other than we can. Um, I've, I've got I've got a few examples out there online where we use a credit card, uh, but I wanted to highlight a, per, a personal line of credit mainly because um, a personal line of credit offers you a unique feature, and we'll get into that as well. So, what does a personal line of credit actually offer? Well, this personal line of credit offers you the opportunity to be able to have an open-ended product. What do I mean by open-ended? Well, compare a line of credit to a mortgage or a loan. The difference between these two, the difference between these two is this is open-ended and this is closed. What that ultimately means is when you put money into your mortgage, can you get money out of it? When you put money into your car loan, can you get money out of it? And the answer is no. Whatever the debt is that you're paying off, when you put money into that mortgage or put money into that loan, it's now captured inside of that. So, th so for those of you who are putting extra money onto your mortgage to hopefully pay it down faster, what you're doing is you're locking up your money. What you're doing is you're uh, handicapping your ability to be able to use that money to do anything else. Whereas a line of credit is open, which means you can get money into it and you can also get money out of it, which means you have the ability to not, you could you have the ability to use a sa the same dollar more than one time. You can use it inside the line of credit, and then you can use it outside of the line of credit. So in essence, you're using the same dollar multiple times. 
So in this situation, we got a personal line of credit of around five thousand dollars. That first line, that personal line of credit was at five percent interest. And so when we using the velocity banking uh, chunking part of the process, we take that five thousand dollar line of credit and we immediately dump it all into the balance of the loan on the scooter. So when we do that, we now created a situation now where you have two payments. You have a payment for a scooter and you now have a payment for a line of credit. And to some, to, especially to my cash people, like how could this possibly be a good thing if now I've taken a situation where I only had one payment for a scooter and now I've just created two. But I'll show you why that one, why that's a positive and two, what you can do with both. So again, you got a $5,000 line of credit that $5,000, $5,000 line of credit at a 5% interest pays um, 50% of the balance of that uh, scooter, which means you now have a remaining $5,000 balance on the scooter. So, and as I mentioned, you got 8% payment on the um, scooter and a 5% payment on the line of credit, but in total, You've created $10,000 of debt. Notice the amount of debt didn't change. You went from having a $10,000 scooter that you owed to a $10, to a $5,000 balance left on the scooter and a $5,000 line of credit, but the amount owed, amount of borrowed debt didn't change. So what does this look like traditionally? Well, for the $5,000 line of credit, again, over the same 60 month period, that's any change colors. Over the same 60 month period, at a monthly payment of about $94.36, it would take you five years to pay off that 5K line of credit. And for that $10,000 loan, if you were to take that $10,000 loan for that scooter and pay that $202.76 over that same five year period, it would take five years to pay back that $10,000 loan. And again, we remember that equated to about $2,166 in interest that was paid. But in total, you have two payments here. You have a $202 payment and a $94 payment, which equates to about $297 in total payments due for the month. That's the traditional way of doing things. This is if, if there was no uh, velocity banking concept that we were initiating. This is just simply if we just simply paid the, paid, uh, paid the, debt, paid the debts that were due uh, with our income coming in. And again, so this is a comparison of the traditional compared to velocity banking. You have income coming in, goes into your checking account. From your checking account, you pay bills. And any cash flow that's left over, once you pay bills, tend to go back into either your checking or savings account. Whereas from a velocity banking perspective, all of your income, once it goes into your checking account, you immediately put it all onto whatever that debt tool is. And in, in this case, it's a personal line of credit. So which means this is next to zero. Maybe you left 50 bucks in it. So you didn't get any, um, uh, zero balance charges or anything like that. But the bottom line is all of the income that you made for that month goes into the debt tool. And then what ends up happening is you pay any bill required from that debt tool. And now what happens, any cash flow that's left over lives here. So instead of it living in your checking account, it's actually living in the debt tool. And what that does is it allows the debt tool, any cash flow that you have left over to pay off the balance. Oh, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Ted wants to know, um, is Alex paying himself first so that he is first so that he is, and then is he paying himself first and then he has $500 left over, I think is what he's wanting to know. What is that cat? What does the cash flow entail? Yep. So is he paying himself first? So any, so when he, whether it's, he's paid biweekly or monthly, doesn't matter. All of that income is going to Alex and Alex is taking that income and putting it on the debt tool. So is he paying himself first? In this case, um, rather than pay a bill first, rather than um, 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 
take care of the payment on the scooter or anything else, all of his income is going into that debt tool. And in this case, the debt tool is what he's using as a vehicle to pay down debt. So in essence, yes. Um, and again, in this case, he makes 3000, he's got 23,000 in expenses and the uh, note on the scooter is another $200. So that remaining cash flow, and again, from a traditional perspective, would be sitting in your savings account collecting that 0.01%. Versus, and from a velocity banking perspective, at $5,000, once the his income, all of his income, all $3,000 of his income is placed on the line of credit, what just happened? Well, it immediately reduced the balance on that line of credit down to 2000 so again, at, at day one or at minute one, when he took that $5,000 and put half of it on the scooter, the balance on that uh, personal line of credit immediately jumped up to $5,000. And then from there, you take that $3,000 of your income, put it on the personal line of credit, which immediately drops that balance from 5,000 down to two. But again, we do have to pay bills. So we're not done yet. So once the three thousand goes on the five, once the three thousand of income goes on that line of credit, and we have two thousand left over, again we do have bills that need to be paid, and this two thousand five hundred dollars includes the scooter. So in essence, we're paying the scooter's first monthly payment, and we're paying the um, um, all of our traditional expenses. But the payment that we're not paying is the payment on the personal uh, line of credit. Why? This income paid for the personal line of credit. So the line of credit, if you remember, the personal line of credit monthly payment is about $94.36. That's a principal and interest payment. But because we put all $3,000 onto the uh, personal line of credit, that satisfies that $94.36 payment. So a couple things. What's happening with the cash flow? Well, that $500 that's living on that personal line of credit is doing a few things. It's reducing the balance over time faster than if you were just paying the $94.36. Think about it. If you put five, five, $3,000 on the personal line of credit, pay bills from the personal line of credit, and you're left with $4,500 at the end of the month. In month one, you went from $5,000 to a balance, new balance of $4,500. That $500 difference, how long would it take for you to get that $500 of room on that personal line of credit if you were just paying the $94.36 every month? It would take about five months, five times $100, $500. It would take about five months, in essence, before you would achieve what you've already done in one month. So at a minimum, we're already paying off the personal line of credit faster than the five years allotted. So... Month one, that $500 cash flow, instead of it sitting in our checking account or sitting in our savings account, bringing us 0.01% interest, that $500 of cash flow that's sitting on that, that line of credit, that $500 cash flow that's sitting on that debt tool is reducing the uh, amortized schedule of payments from um, five months that it would normally take into one. Hopefully I'm making sense. And then the income acts as a payment reducer, which means when we put our income into the debt tool, it immediately pays for that 9436, that monthly payment. So there's not a monthly payment owed in addition. So notice we're using the same dollar twice. It goes in on the personal, the, your income goes into the personal line of credit. The minute it hits the personal line of credit, it takes care of that $94 payment. Then that same dollar goes from the debt tool to your bills. We're using the same dollar two times. But what does that look like over time? Let's see here. Grab a color that would make sense. So what does that look like over time? So over time, again, this is the personal line of credit. What's happening in that personal line of credit is at month one or at month zero, we're taking $5,000 off the personal line of credit and putting it on the scooter. So the minute you do that, the balance from the personal line of credit automatically goes from zero up to $5,000.
but then we get paid in month one. And when we get paid in month one, we immediately pay $3,000 onto the debt tool. But we do still have to pay bills. And when we pay bills out of the debt tool, there's another, what, uh, $2,500 in expenses that are paid on that debt tool. And when that happens, that drops, that, that creates a balance, that creates a balance of $4,500. But then in month two, we do it again. Income comes in to the debt tool. That income, oh, income comes into the debt tool. And when that income comes into the debt tool, it immediately drops that balance from 4,500 down to 1,500. But we still have to pay bills. And we pay bills of 2,500 from the debt tool. And so again, once we do that, again, we do this month after month. Oh my gosh. We do this month after month. And as we do this month after month, what's happening is the balance on the debt tool is slowly increasing. I mean, slowly decreasing. And as that balance decreases, we're paying off the debt faster. So instead of this taking five years, what looked like a five year payoff of $5,000 ends up becoming a 10 month payoff of $5,000. And there's many approaches here. We could intermittently chunk another dollar amount onto the uh, scooter to pay it down faster. But what I'm showing you here is if we just simply allow the debt tool to be paid off in the 10 month time frame, I have no idea why I'm <laughs> showing. Um, if we use allow the debt tool to pay off or, or allow our income to pay off the debt tool in the 10 month time frame, now we're at zero. Once we're at zero, once we have paid off the personal line of credit and paid our normal bills, we have to now at this point, go find more debt. We have to now at this point, go do something with this additional $5,000 that we have. So what do we do? We have to go find more debt. But before I do that, what's happening during this time frame? what is actually happening with the scooter? So this is what's happening inside of the personal line of credit, but what's happening with the scooter? So again, if you remember, at month one, we took $5,000 from the personal line of credit and we took that 5K and put it on the scooter. And when we did that, that immediately dropped, dropped the balance down to $5,000. And every month we paid 202, every month. And so notice, as we're paying that 202, a certain amount of that interest and principal is knocking down the balance. So by month nine, at the same time that we had hit a zero point inside of our PLOC, we're sitting with a balance of about $3,500 left on the scooter. So what ends up happening, and I think this side by side kind of says it a little bit better Let me make this a little bit smaller. Looking at it side by side, at this point, we're going to take another, we don't necessarily need 5,000 at this point. We're going to take another 3,500 from the personal line of credit, and we're going to pay off the scooter. So not only did we pay off the personal line of credit in a total of 10 months, we paid off the scooter in a little bit less than that. But when we take this 3,500, from the personal line of credit to pay off the scooter, it immediately makes the balance of the personal line of credit go back up. So again, kind of deep dive this a little bit. Over that 10 month period, we would have paid about $317 of interest on that scooter. So instead of paying it off in five years, we actually paid it off in 10 months. 
And again, in month one, we put $5,000 on the scooter. At month 10, we took the remaining $3,500 and paid off the remaining amount. Between years month, I'm sorry, between months one and month 10, we were paying our $202. So we were slowly paying off that line of, I'm sorry, we were slowly paying off the scooter. But then at month 10, or yeah, at month 10 is when we fully paid it off. So instead of taking five years to pay this dollar amount off, it was paid off in a span of what, 10 months total? Yeah. But what also happened with the line of credit? So notice, it took us roughly 10 months to pay off the scooter. But when we dropped that 3,500 from the uh, personal line of credit onto the scooter, it made the balance of the personal line of credit go back up. So now we have to spend that same time paying off the personal line of credit. And again, it's no different than what we were doing before. All income goes into the uh, personal line of credit. We pay bills from the personal line of credit. And over time, it would take another, what is that? Um, a total of eight months. Yeah, another eight months or so that we ended up taking for us to pay off that personal line of credit. So the question then is, what happens between here and here? If we've paid off the scooter, we've paid off the personal line of credit in about 18 months or whatever that time frame would be, we've got all of this time left on this personal line of credit to be able to use for whatever we want. So we need to go find more debt. What do we do with this period of time? And this is just a recap. Put 3,000 of income onto the debt tool, we paid our expenses, and we killed them all. We have no more uh, debt as it relates to the scooter. We have no more debt as it relates to the personal line of credit. Now, if you break down these expenses, what are these numbers, uh, you know, what's made up in these numbers? We got, you know, your, your traditional expenses like cable and phone. But you also may have, what, uh, student loans in there. You might have uh, rent. Uh, if I could spell. You might have, uh, well, maybe it's not rent. Maybe it's mortgage. Like whatever those actions are inside of that expense. Now we have um, another, what, 3.2 uh, 3.2 years to be able to use this $5,000 um, line of credit to be able to pay off more bills. And just to kind of summarize, if we would have done this the traditional way, if we would have done what everyone else does as it relates to paying, paying off debt, it would have taken five years and we would have given the bank $2,166 in interest. By just taking a different approach, using a debt tool to be able to pay down the debt faster, we turn that 2166 into more like 448 and paid it off 3.2 years sooner. Now, I think Ted was the one that mentioned cash, right? For my cash people, if you're if you're paying attention to this, there's about five hundred dollars of cash flow living on the on the debt tool, paying it off faster. Well, if you would have just taken that $500 a month in cash flow, let it sit in your savings account and just put that $500 a month onto the scooter. How could that have been any better? How could that have been any different? Well, if you would have done that, you would have paid off, again, in the same 18 month period, you would have still paid off the scooter, but you would have still spent about $1,039 in interest just by paying cash and paying it off during that same period of time. But in addition, what about your emergency fund? What if uh, the car broke down during the, or the, the scooter broke down during that uh, 18 month time frame and you had to pay an expense on that maintenance? Where's that income coming from if you take all of your cash flow and dump it into uh, your scooter? Again, it's a closed in product. Once you put money in it, you can't get money out of it. Whereas with the line of credit, if some uh, extenuating circumstance came about or if, um, um, you know, you wanted to go on vacation or take your wife on a date or you wanted to do anything extra, you have 
full access to all of the income that was put into that debt tool to be able to do whatever you want. So you aren't handicapped. We have a question if you're I'm listening. Okay. I'm going to put it up on the screen so you can see it. Mm -hmm. She wants to know, is it wise to do this with a debt tool that already has a balance? That's a great question. Um, yeah, great question. And the truth behind that is, well, let me, let me, I guess, give you a little bit of insight into our personal situation. Um, Velocity banking is what took my personal credit score from about a 504 up to about 720 in about six months. And I did velocity banking, not using a debt tool like a personal line of credit, because you'd have to qualify for things like that. I did velocity banking using a high limit credit card and my high limit credit card was maxed out. So I, I, again, I think at the time it was probably a twenty thousand um, dollar credit card. And I was making anywhere between five, seven thousand dollars a month. So if you take five thousand dollars on a high limit credit card that's maxed out at twenty grand, you drop five thousand dollars onto that credit card, that immediately takes that balance from twenty thousand dollars down to fifteen. So um, does it make sense? Is it wise to use a um, a debt tool that already has a balance? Sometimes you don't have a choice. The key is the because um, what this takes is diligence and commitment. Um, it was somewhat stressful for me to uh, kind of wrap my head around taking all of our cash flow and letting it live on a credit card. Like, what if something happens? Uh, I was, I, I really, really struggled in that space. And so again, for my cash people, I'm sure this is a concept that it, you, it's difficult to wrap your head around because I took savings, I took cash flow and it all lived on our debt tool. That was probably 50 bucks in savings and maybe another 30 sitting in my checking. Everything went on the debt tool, but here's what happened. In the span of about six months, that entire $20,000 balance was zero. And then what happened after that is we went in, went, went to go find other, other expenses. So hopefully that answers the question. The short answer to that question is, um, yeah, it's wise. And again, for my cash people, like the thought process is why do I need this debt tool <clears throat> to be able to do this concept. Why can't I just take my cash flow and pay down the debt? Yeah, you can, but what did you just do? You just handicapped yourself as it relates to your cash flow. And you're using the same dollar one time. So you're impacting your ability to use the same dollar multiple times. And <clears throat> this piece is huge. And it, it's kind of, I guess it takes some explanation, but the compounding leverage piece. Um, in the process of using the same dollar multiple times, what's happening is you're able to stack leverageable actions to be able to use them multiple times. And then the last part is you're absolutely sacrificing more than you think. So in essence, what was a $12,000 bill ended up becoming a $10,000 um, what's going on here? There it is. Ended up becoming a ten thousand dollar bill. So saved what about sixteen thousand dollars in interest, and was able to pay off two debts in the span of about twelve months. I mean, a span of about eighteen months. But what are the other things that happened during that process? And I think of it from even the personal situation that I had mentioned. The minute you take a debt um, that is sitting on your credit uh, credit report, and it's a high yield debt and you pay it off in from what is supposed to be a five year period down to about 18 months, what does that say to the creditors? What does it say to the people who are, uh, what does it say to your credit score? I guess in essence is what I'm getting at. What's end up, what ends up happening is your credit score takes a huge jump because you just addressed this debt in record time. And because your credit score went up, what other options that, does that present to you? Now you get to actually go get more leverage. For instance, this personal line of credit being $5,000. If I paid off this personal line of credit in the span of 18 months, what's stopping me from going back to the bank and going, hey, can, we, can I get that personal line of credit increased? In our personal situation where we used a high interest credit card of $20,000 and I paid it off in the span of six months, you better believe I went right back to Bank of America and said, hey, I need a credit limit increase. What is going to stop them from, or what is, what is, 
what situation have I placed myself in for them to give them the excuse to not give me the credit limit increase? I've improved my DTI. I've paid off debt in record time and my cash flow increased. If that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's just so, and this is a short list of what those benefits are. <laughs> and from Alex's perspective, what else can he do? Yeah, what Alex other opportunities is, are there? Go ahead. Alex is thinking the right thing right here. Right. There are so many other things that can be done during this period of time. And again, I go back to increasing your credit limit. Um, how about paying off other credit cards? Or better yet, going back and getting a higher personal line of credit, which means in essence, you're accessing more leverage. And for those of us who use credit cards as our debt tool, what about the increase in perks and points and the other opportunities available to you because um, you're paying all of your bills through these debt tools, which now means you're accumulating that uh, cash back. So that 3% cash back is just multiplying, right? And again, it's really, there's really no limit to what, you, what you're able to access or what you're able to do. And again, this is all by using a debt tool. Remember, we ended up picking up two payments, but because we were a little bit different, we took a di little bit different approach as to how we um, managed our finances. And then last but not least, this is absolutely how we were able to get 200 months ahead on our mortgage. It's by simply taking um, a non-traditional approach to eliminating debt. And so from Alex's Alex perspective, He's got the vehicle paid off. He's addressed his, his credit card. What's left? Well, what if it's time to purchase a home? What if it's time to um, kind of take some opportunities and use this, uh, uh, this, this new leverage space that he's in, this uh, improved credit, this improved DTI, to now go qualify for a home and do this exact same process using the home? What if he used this home as the debt tool? So instead of a credit card, instead of a personal line of credit, what if this is his debt tool? And for most of us, if not all of us who own a home, this is our largest asset. So imagine being able to leverage your largest asset to pay off bills and to put yourself in a better financial position. What are your thoughts, sweetheart? All right, I'm coming in. I, um, first of all, this is the part that I wanted to get to, but I knew that you could not fully explain this concept without really walking through the framework of what velocity banking is, because it sounds crazy to a lot of people and they go, why would we do that? This sounds like a risk. It sounds dumb. Everything I've been taught, don't want to do it. That sounds like too much information. I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. But when you see this, you start to understand how the decisions that you're making are actually keeping you poor. And this is why in the book, everyone ends up poor. This is exactly why, because we just, just some tweaks of information using the same money, the same amount of money. This doesn't show him using an extra dollar that there's he no has raised. Made. There's no tax return. There's nothing additional. And Nothing. we're still able to pay off $10,000 of debt in under two years. Right. What I love about this, though, and I think you do such a good job in explaining this, is why I think it was important that you be out here telling people about this, not just because we benefit. It's It feels selfish to know that th this is we're making bigger, faster moves because of information, not because of more money. It is such a relief to know that we don't have to become millionaires, right? There are so many people out here who are trying and they're looking for what is it that we can do to create where the truth is you can take what you currently have now and you can do some pretty powerful stuff with it. And that's what I've, that's my biggest takeaway from here. Amy says, Amy Allred on um, Facebook says, I literally cannot wait to share this with my family. And that's exactly how this information feels. But what's hard is like you get all excited and you go velocity banking we all should be doing this velocity banking and then they're like what is it and you go to try to explain and when you explain it to them they go well their eyes gloss over because here's the thing <laughs> no, no different than tuesday what we're communicating or what i'm communicating is not sexy 
like there's nothing fun about it. There's no joke to be made. Like other than the visuals, like I appreciate the visuals because otherwise it's just it's just me talking. So there is something to look at other than me and my pen. But this is not sexy. Right. I will but say, though, these graphics, work, though, Alex on this bike, told a little story. I, I appreciate Canva. But when you Canva. see this work, though, that's the sexy part. Yeah. You having access to all of your equity in your home or you having access to five thousand dollars on a whim to be able to do whatever you want to do. Like that's the sexy part. That part. Yeah. And for us, what that meant was and here here's something that is this is true story. Our, we I got a phone call that said because recently all four of our of our kids needed cars. They needed a new car. They needed new wheels. They, they had needed to get into a vehicle. And we said, okay, we will be the bank. We're the bank now, and we're going to go and finance these cars. Now, what would this story look like if we hadn't started this process at some point, right, to be able to leverage it when we needed to? We would have had to walk into a place. We would have had to try to explain to them the importance of credit and then we would have had to make make sure that they were going to make good on their payment. But you know who is going to be co-signing on that loan regardless, right? And who gets to make the rules? The bank. Well, you, we just saw what Alex had to pay. That is what our kids would have been forced to pay. And we would have essentially started them off drowning in, uh, in financially in these types of practices. But now that we're the bank, right? It's different. Right. And so this I got This house is the bank. This house is the bank. Is the and bank. so- yeah. Right. And so when the, our kids need a car, we say, look, where are we going? Let's go find you a car. And we're the bank. So we are not restricted in the same ways as other people. And therefore, we can make moves. Now, what happens if you don't have access to this? The car that starts to have problems, now you're forced to fix that car because you cannot go get a new car, right? You don't have a down payment or you are not prepared with your credit to be able to qualify for something that makes sense. You're going to pay more in interest the higher the interest rate. So we're being generous by saying 8%. That was what Alex got. But some people, they don't qualify for an 8% or anything close to it. So imagine the difference. $2,100 is 8% for Alex. For some people, it's more up in the teens, teens. and 20s yeah that's right because right. so, again it's based off credit score you know um credit score dti and all of those other things that make you um um uh, look good to the bank and right. so not everyone can qualify so you're absolutely right so when you're in a position to be able to take your own asset haggle with the um the um the dealerships like you would normally do beat them down like you would normally do and then when you go back to that finance room and they say, here, this is paperwork for that loan, you go, ah, eh, that's all right. I'm going to finance it myself. And we do. We've done this. To, we're on our fourth time right now. I, all morning long, I was out looking at cars. And this will be the, the fourth time that we've done it. And every single time, it is just this reminder of how dope it is to be able to go out here and make moves like this. But here's the thing. This isn't because we opted into some program and we you know changed our lives in some sort of way with making more money or we 10x our our income or whatever those things are that people are out here promising so that you can eventually make moves like this you could start making moves like this right now right that, now and that's kind of my point here because this is a debt tool but this is not the only debt tool like Again, it could be a credit card. It could be a personal line of credit. But it could also be a whole life policy. It could also be an index universal life policy. It absolutely can be an MPI plan. Oh, that's, that's not an M. An MPI plan. Like there are many different tools that can be used to be able to achieve the same goal. And I would say most of us are limited by our imagination. We're not limited by what we can or can't do or what we can or cannot qualify for. Again, there are many different ways to go about this. Savings accounts can be used as a debt tool. You can borrow up to 50% from your 401k in a personal loan. You can use your 401k as a debt tool. Like there are many different ways to go about this. Just many, many different. Hey, before you go, we want to remind you that becoming fully self-directed means gaining complete control over your wealth. 
time, and freedom. It's not just an idea. It's a framework, a mindset, and the power to make informed decisions to secure your future. Being here means you're taking those steps, and we want to thank you for allowing us to guide you. We believe that we grow farther and faster when we grow together. So tune in next time and tell a friend to tell a friend. We've helped thousands of people just like you start their journey to financial freedom. And if they can do it, you can too. And if you're ready to learn more, we got you. Get a head start by grabbing these two free books. But how do they get them, Donnell? Head over to my website where you'll have access to a few things. A ton of free resources, case studies, and over 100 five-star reviews from people just like you. And in 15 minutes, we can explore what's possible for you. So don't wait. Invest in what what you you want, want, when you want. want. But first, let us help you get self-directed.